I'm glad to see so many familiar faces in the audience. I've seen some of, you, some of my presentations in the past. If not, like you said, my name is Pam Bond. Uh, I'm on the Idaho Trails Association Executive Board. And this is my second season of putting on a presentation series in the winter, basically to give more information to our users about enjoying um, and respectfully enjoying the, the outdoors in Idaho when we're out on our awesome trails. And so just so you're aware, I do have a, a microphone on, but there's no speaker that's going to be making this any louder. I'm actually recording this presentation, and so this is just going to be picking up my voice. And so if we do have any questions, just raise your hand, and we'll either come to you or just repeat the question back. All right, so today we're going to be talking about devices like PLBs and satellite communicators. Before we get started with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some trail news. Maybe. Okay, so in 2016, the National Forest System Trail Stewardship Act was brought down by the U.S. Forest Service, and they're basically not just told, but are required to significantly increase the role of volunteers and partners in trail maintenance. And also within that act, they've listed 15 priority areas where we have a serious backlog of trail maintenance. And this includes a large chunk of central Idaho in the wilderness complex, starting in the Frank Church all the way up to the Malad Larkins Pioneer area and Hell's Canyon. They're also been tasked with having their volunteer groups double the amount of work that they're doing. They used to think of volunteer groups as a way to augment the work that they were being done that they are doing, but now it is deemed critical to their work. And now in the 2018 Omnibus appropri Appropriation Bill, because of this, they have cut the practice of fire borrowing. Do you guys know what I mean when I say fire, fire borrowing? So the Forest Service has a really bad habit of taking money out of other programs to feed the, the wildfire activity uh, funds. And so this was causing, you know, we're already having a deficit of trail, trail maintenance because the funds have been consistently cut, but then they're also stealing that money to help fight wildfires. And so this bill is basically allowing at least those programs to keep their money so that the money that is designated for uh, trail maintenance goes to trail maintenance and restoration after wildfire activities. So just to bring it home a little bit so you understand a little bit about what's going on in Idaho, there are over 10,000 miles of non-motorized trails in Idaho. Even with some increased funding from the stimulus bill in 2009, we know that less than 30% of our non-motorized trails meet national quality standards. In 2016, there were almost 66,000 volunteers or cooperator hours spent on trail maintenance with a value of over $1.5 million. In that same year, over 50% of trail maintenance was done by volunteers and other partner organizations. So in 2016, only 40% of the U.S. Forest Service trails were being maintained by the Forest Service. And this is coming directly from a University of Idaho College of Natural Resource Policy Analyst Group issued in 2017. And it says flat out that without additional funding for maintenance through existing or new dedicated sources, non-motorized trail opportunities on Idaho's national forests are likely to decline. And I don't know how many of you spend time in the like backcountry, backcountry of Idaho, but they already are declining. And we're losing connectivity, and this is causing bottlenecks in access and unsafe conditions. So this is where Idaho Trails Association comes in. And just to tell you a little bit about us, we were formed in 2010. Our mission is to promote the continued enjoyment of Idaho's hiking trails through stewardship, tradition, education, and preservation. And with stewardship, I mean we're going out actually having boots on the ground activities like trail maintenance and construction. 
We will also help with things like bridge replacements and things of that nature. Uh, we really believe in fostering uh, the development of traditional trail maintenance skills like using crosscut saws, Pulaski's. Um, we stick to the Forest Service standards, so all of the trails that we maintain, we try to maintain for stock. Um, we like to put on educational programs like this so that you are better prepared to go out and safely and respectfully use Idaho's trails. And then we also advocate for preservation, protection, and access of our trails. So just to give you an idea of how, how much ITA has grown since inception, we have increased our volunteer hours 10 years since, or excuse me, tenfold since 2010. And so you can see we're kind of right in line with that mandate from the Forest Service. We're on, a, we're on a five year track to double the amount of work we've been doing and you can see we're already growing with leaps and bounds. And with that, you can see that the value of those volunteer hours has also significantly increased. We're now at over $180,000 worth of value just with our volunteer hours. And just to give you a quick comparison, even between the last couple of years, in all gamuts of our work, we've increased our volunteers, the number of projects we're doing, and obviously our monetary value. We've been listening to our volunteers and trying to bump up our number of uh, multi-day trips and one-day projects so people have an easier time to get out and they're not spending their whole week-long vacation doing trail maintenance. And this is an easy entry point for people to come in and see if they're even into it. So how can you help? First, I would suggest becoming a member. Right now, we are doing our membership drive. And if you signed up in the back, you'll be getting our newsletter, and that will show you how you can sign up to become a member. And then you will also stay informed about activities like this. And also in the spring, when we put out our um, trail, trail projects, you'll be updated on that. And if you're a member, you get a, a month extra of, above non-members for signing up for the coveted trail spots. So if you've had your eye on checking out the white clouds or something like that, you get first dibs. Um, so you can sign up for trail projects. We do have some family-friendly projects, especially around National Trails Day and National Public Lands Day, some that are really close to home. We almost always do something out in the Owyhee country. Um, we have some single days, overnights, and also our week-long vacations. And I do call them vacations because some of them are pretty posh. We'll have stock bring in a lot of your gear and tools and food. You may even have somebody like the infamous Steve Weston, chef in the wild, out there cooking your meals for you. We make sure you're really taken care of and having a good time. And as a volunteer, that means you get to do as much work as you want. Obviously, we have some expectations that you do some work while you're out there, but we do want you to have a good time. We don't want anybody to get hurt, and we want people to come back, and we want people to be out there using the trails. And then also just be an advocate. Be a part of the process. Contact your congressman. Um, you know, stay in touch with us and what we're doing. And if you have other ideas, we are game. We're always looking for people who have awesome ideas to help us grow our organization, advocate for our trails, and have more boots on the ground. OK, so with that, we'll get done with that, and we'll talk about the meat of our presentation. This device could save your life. So just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what we'll be discussing, um, I'll be discussing the difference between PLBs, personal locator beacons, and satellite communicators, some of your purchase options. As Eric said, you can purchase many of those models here, why you should use one, and then Greg from Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue Unit will be talking about when it's appropriate to press that SOS button. <laughs> it's not always. <laughs> It's not if you ran out of water or <laughs> you just don't feel like walking anymore. Um, what to expect when you do press that SOS button, and then maybe share some stories um, from some of his experiences. Okay, so personal locator beacons are not the same thing as satellite communicators. Is anybody shocked when I say that? These are two different things. Not, not every model is, is a personal locator beacon. So a personal locator beacon only sends out an emergency distress signal. 
And that signal is monitored by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the US Air Force, and the US Coast Guard. Satellite communicators, and when I say satellite communicator, I mean things like Garmin Delorum or Spot. Um, these allow you to send short text messages or your coordinates, do some two-way communicating. This, the signals of these go out to a commercial response center in Texas, and the signal transmission is much less powerful than a personal locator beacon. And we're talking in, in you know, almost more than twice. So a spot will send out a signal of less than 1.5 watts, and a personal locator beacon will spend it, send out a signal at 5 watts. And so basically that means you know, if you're standing in the middle of a forest, you probably might, will get a signal out with a PLB, but you probably won't with a spot. You'll have to have a clear view. And I've read multiple times that satellite communicators are not intended for serious mountain use, mountaineering use. And so from that, I basically gathered, if you're doing something really serious, really extreme, where you know that your life might depend on being rescued, carry something like a PLB, not just a satellite communicator, or do both. But just something, a PLB at the end of the day is just going to be more reliable than a satellite communicator. Not to say that you shouldn't have a satellite communicator, it has its place. But if you're getting into extreme sports or anything like that, or big mountaineering trips, I would suggest carrying a PLB. Okay. So what is a PLB? I really got into researching this and I was really excited that you're all here to share because um, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes into it, having to do with satellites and signals and things. I'm going to try really hard just to gloss over that. But anytime if you have any questions, I'll be happy to go in further and we can also discuss after the presentation. So personal locator beacons have been available in the U.S. since 2003. It's the land-based equivalent of um, the beacons that you would use in boats or in airplanes, ELTs, those have been used since the mid-90s, but the technology for PLBs hasn't, wasn't available until 2003. Like I said, this is monitored by NOAA, the Air Force, and the United States Coast Guard. You might ask, why would NOAA be monitoring emergency locator beacon transmissions? And that's because um, on their weather satellites, they do have the, the sensors that pick up the signal that these beacons put out. And so they're not usually monitoring it, mostly it's the, the Coast Guard and the Air Force doing it, but they do still play a big part in like research and development for these systems. Something to know about the PLB is when you buy one, federal law requires that you register it with the NOAA StarSat, so that's search and rescue um, satellite aided tracking database and I've put the put the um, link up here it's very easy beacon registration at NOAA.gov and once you've registered NOAA will link your essential personal information to a 15 character code your unique identifying number and so what's great about this is when you send a distress signal all of that information goes with it and so it's really important that you not only keep that up to date but it's also if you sell it or if you buy somebody else's, you have to keep that up to date. If you move, you want to keep that up to date. If your personal contact information, you want to keep that up to date. So that when you do get in that situation where you press that SOS button, they have the right information about you. So like I said, the SOS provides um, information about your location and also your name, address, medical conditions, which could be good to know, and also your device of origin. So when you press that SOS button, a signal is sent out to a network of international satellites that are part of the COSPAS StarSat. And COSPAS is actually a Russian acronym for, uh, it's like searching for vessels in distress. And the StarSat again is search and rescue satellite aided tracking. And this is an international humanitarian search and rescue system. So there are agreements between a lot of different countries um, that allow them all to be using this military, basically military grade, three tiered satellite system uh, for finding people all over the world. So uh, I did see some information that, you know, there's a lot of questions about if you can use these internationally or in different countries, and the answer is yes. 
The, the only thing I would say is if you are a polar explorer, this does limit some of your options because of the way satellites fly and orbit around the Earth. You don't get as good a signal or you may not get a signal all of the time. But for like that 70% around the equator, um, with something like a PLB, you're going to have a transmission sent and received in seconds. So a PLB sends two different signals. A 406 megahertz signal, which carries that unique um, identification number with all of your information and GPS data, um, and that gets sent up to the satellites. And it also has a 121.5 megahertz signal. And this is now used as a homing frequency. So when, when the signal gets sent up, this gets sent up with the 406 megahertz, the, the, the um, monitoring centers get that information. They transmit it to whoever the local authorities are, the search and rescue unit is. And then they can go out and then use this 121.5 megahertz frequency to look for you on the ground. So as they get closer to you as a homing frequency if they need to. Um, it was interesting that we're actually in a really good place with PLBs where it wasn't, not, not all of them used to have both the 406, the 125, and GPS. It was actually pretty uncommon for them to actually have a GPS built into them. Um, go ahead, Lavelle, I'll have you. Um, it wasn't until 2017 that they required that PLBs must have a GPS. And obviously this makes sense because it's going to help them locate you even faster. Um, without getting too much into the weeds, uh, is in 2016, the PLBs also used this medium Earth orbit satellite constellation that will give you near instantaneous detection of that 406 megahertz signal. And you, they can technically locate you um, where you are without actual GPS information based off of satellite movement and that single signal pinging back and forth. But the GPS makes it accurate down to about 100 meters. And so it's just less searching that they have to do for you. So anymore, it's very standard for them to have the 406 megahertz, the 121.5 megahertz, and a GPS. If you're going to be looking for a PLB, I would suggest getting a newer model that has all three of those things. So just a little bit of a graphic to kind of show you what happens when you push the SOS button. If you're in a boat, an airplane, or a person, you're going to push it. It's going to send a satellite, a signal up to a set of satellites. That's going to get sent down to a local use terminal or a ground control unit. And that then gets pushed back to the mission control center, and they send that out to rescue coordination teams. And this can actually all happen within minutes. So how long will a PLB stay activated once you've pressed that button? They usually come with lithium batteries that will stay dormant until a PLB is activated, and it will stay dormant for years. They do recommend that you get the batteries replaced every five years. They do not recommend you try and do it yourself. Typically, the company wants you to send back to them. There are also other companies that you can send, the, you can send in your devices, and they'll change the batteries out for you but just put it on the calendar to get that changed out every five years. Because when it comes down to it and you need to be rescued and you can't get that thing to turn on, you'll really regret not doing it. <laughs> so, and then they're also talking about um, how long it's supposed to transmit for. So there are regulations that, that's, that say that in class one situations with these heavy duty batteries, it must transmit negative 40 for 24 hours, but most of the PLBs that we have for recreational use, like I'll talk about here, have class two batteries and they must transmit at negative 20 degrees for 24 hours. And in most cases, like if you're out in the summer and it's 60 degrees, that would probably be 48 hours. Cold temperatures obviously will shorten the battery life. And again, like I said, um, it will be twice as long when it's warmer outside. All right, so now to switch gears a little bit, we'll talk about satellite communicators. And again, this is things like SPOT, uh, DeLorme, or Garmin in reach systems like that. These also have been called satellite emergency notification devices. They are GPS-based GPS systems, and they use commercial satellite networks. And so this is um, unlike the PLBs who use three different satellite systems. Each of these units only use one satellite system. 
Um, DeLorme and Garmin use the Iridian system. It's made up of 66 satellites and has 100% global coverage, so it does cover the poles. Spot uses Global Star, and that has 48 satellites, all but the polar regions and the sub-Sahara. So if you plan on going through the Sahara, I suggest getting a Garmin. Um, the SOS is sent to a privately run response, response coordination center in Texas. It's not being monitored by the Coast, the Coast Guard or the Air Force. But, but satellite communicators do have some advantages and disadvantages. One, a couple of the nice things about the satellite communicators and one of the reasons they're fit for people who are doing, you know, just their kind of normal biking, backpacking, hiking, is it's really easy to check in and it's really easy for people to follow you. You can basically set up breadcrumbs where every 10 minutes you're going to send your location out and it's going to show up on a map uh, at your parents' house or your loved one's house. You can send messages, one-way and two-way messages. Um, I know some of the systems allow you to not only communicate back to you know, your loved ones who are at home, but if you each have a device, you could be out there communicating with each other as well. And then there's also a way for you to know that your messages were sent and confirmed. And so on your device, it will tell you, you know, message sent, message complete, whatever. Some disadvantages are there are some more hefty activation and subscription fees associated with the communicators. But if you think about it, you know, we have a cell phone where you're sending out data and things. You pay for that. A similar system. Um, with the personal locator beacons, you pay a one-time fee, and that's basically the, the price of the unit. And um, you don't have any subscription fees associated with it like you do with the satellite communicators. Another disadvantage, like I talked about before, is there's a much weaker emergency signal transmission, so making them less effective. So if you use these units and you're having a hard time getting your signal out, you need to make sure that you have a clear view of the sky. And I'm not just talking about the hole above you. Typically, it will have to be some sort of an angle above you. And so you have to get out of the trees um, into an open space where you can have a really good view of the sky. And sometimes even a really cloudy day can interrupt your transmission. Um, so this is a picture of, so I have an InReach Explorer, or actually an old Delorum. Um, they've now been bought out by Garmin. Uh, and so this is kind of the online platform for where you kind of sign up, kind of like what you would do with a PLB, so they have all of your information. You can also set up your messages so you can have a bunch of like predefined messages that you put in there so when you're out there you can just kind of scroll through them and send them there also are options to have it synced up with your phone and you can use your phone for messaging just like you would with any other text messaging also using all of your contacts um, this also allows you to set up uh, kind of a list of your go-to contacts your priority contacts and that will be stored in your actual unit um, you are also given a unique identification, and it's really easy to kind of sync and update your unit from, from a platform like this. And this is where you can set up your different subscription options um, and things like that. I know that this one is a little bit hard for some of you to read, but it gives a really good rundown about some of the differences between something like a spot and an inReach. So again, going back to the transmission power, an inReach has a transmission power of 1.6 watts, and a spot, it's 0.4 watts. And now I understand why. When I was using a spot, so I did a, a long-distance hiking trip, and every day I was hitting that spot to check in. Half of the time it didn't work. I didn't know that, though. I had an old-school Gen 3 spot and there's no way for you to, to get a confirmation. And so it wasn't until I got back to civilization and called and said, did you see me? That I knew that half of it wasn't working. That didn't make me feel very good. Because <laughs> I'm like, I did the same thing every night, like at the same time. Um, that did not give me much peace of mind. Now, there are a lot of people who still carry spots, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but just be aware that because of that low transmission power, you have to be really aware of where you're setting that signal off. Again, different satellite networks. With the inReach, you can set up many of these preset messages with the old school spots. It's only three. 
Um, lots of infield customization with the in-reach units, two-way messaging, confirmation of track points being successfully sent, on-screen display with the in-reach, using it with your smartphone, battery life indicator, rechargeable, um, easy to carry. Cost of the unit for something like an in-reach is around the 270 mark. We'll go into that a little bit more, but with something like a spot, at least with the Spot Gen 3 version, you, there is no two-way messaging. You, you can send a couple of preset messages. You can send a kind of I'm okay message. You can do some, a little bit of tracking and then have an SOS button, but there's no screen involved or any kind of uh, syncing up with your, your phone. So we'll go over a few of the different purchase options. And again, you can buy these at REI. <laughs> Um, that are available. So for the personal locator beacons, again and again, I saw people talking about the ACR units, and there's the Rescue Link and the Aqualink versions. I just get the impression that the Aqualink is more waterproof than the Rescue Link. Um, again, these are a one-time use device. The batteries are not replaceable yourself. You need to send that in. Um, if, and I did find out that if you actually use one of these in emergency, you share your story with the company, they will replace your unit for free. So keep that in mind. <laughs> kind of a perk, I guess, of being rescued. <laughs> um, so let's see. So the rescue link is about $290, but there are no subscriptions. So this is a one-time deal. The aqua link is a little bit more expensive, $500. Um, but it also is uh, more waterproof and it has screen display so you can see things like latitude, longitude, some things like operating instructions, um, how much remaining battery power you have. You can do some non-emergency messaging like sending an I'm okay and a GPS coordinate to a pre-select email address. So they're trying to do a little bit of a hybrid here with the satellite communicating, but again, pretty expensive at 500 bucks. Um, both of them have GPS acquisition you can test and um, GPS functions last up to 12 times over the battery life of the battery and again they both have the 406 and the 121.5 megahertz and GPS receivers come with an LED strobe for flashing down your emergency rescue helicopter um, the rescue link is buoyant floating waterproof design and um, they both have a five-year battery replacement life. Um, another version of the PLB I came across the many times was the McMurdo FastBind 220. It's 250 bucks. Again, same, same uh, frequencies, GPS, same set of satellites it's using. Um, a little bit more affordable, and again, you can test the battery of this. It's a little bit more... Um, not, not quite as expensive of an option. With the satellite communicators, I feel like it used to be Delorum until I think last year, Garmin now kind of runs the market. They bought out Delorum. Um, with the satellite communicators, the, the in-reach systems have, have kind of beat out all the competition right now. And so there's three different versions um, that are really popular, the in-reach mini, which is kind of the smallest lightweight version. It doesn't have a whole lot going on as far as with the screen um, for doing things like navigation and sending messages. You really kind of would rely on the app that comes with it. But there, you can do some, some simple things on the screen there, but you, you'd have to have your smartphone out there with you to really maximize the functionality. But even without your smartphone, you can still press the SOS button. So. If all else fails, you, you, you'll still have that. And then the InReach Explorer is kind of like the Swiss Army knife um, version, where it's basically taking a Garmin GPS unit and then slapping in some satellite communication. And so you can do all of the things you would with a, a, a Garmin GPS device, and then you just add in the two-way communication, the breadcrumbs, and uh, the SOS button. And the satellite, or, or excuse me, the InReach SE is basically the same thing as the InReach, but without added maps and sensors, like I think it's like an altimeter and a gyroscope for just if you really like to geek out about your specs or whatever. Um, 
And right now, uh, I think REI is also honor honoring this. The InReach Explorer is the same price as the InReach SE. So you can get a, a $50, um, $50 off that model right now. Okay. And just to talk a little bit about the similarities. So they all have the lithium ion batteries. They're long lasting, 90 to 100 hours with that 10 minute interval tracking, constant tracking. Um, and you can recharge it with a USB port. And if you're out there for a really long time, I know when I'm out on big trips, I, I will always have a little um, external battery that I can use for charging things. It's like the size of a deck of cards. It doesn't weigh very much. And so if you're planning on being out for a really long time, you could always use that to recharge this device. Um, you can store up to 500 waypoints and 20 routes. Again, you can connect to the app with a Bluetooth connection using the EarthMate app. I've used this several times to just, when we're out, um, it's one of the nice things about um, when you're using something like the Garmin's is, I don't feel bad about sending out messages and stuff out there because I'm already using the subscription. I'm already paying for it. And so this is also a great way of getting in the habit of knowing how to use your system. And so before we leave on a trip, we let somebody know where we're going and we also let them know at some point you're gonna get a weird message from us saying, probably garbly gook, here's some coordinates, we're okay. And so people know they're going to be expecting it. They kind of will know what it's going to look like if they ever do that, get that message. So if the day does ever come that we have to send them a message saying, I'm hurt, you need to send some help, they will already know, okay, this message has come from Pam and Jeremiah, they must need help. And so that is a, it's a good way for you to learn how to use it, and it's a good way for you to get your network used to seeing those messages coming from you and not just being like, oh, this is spam, I'm going to delete it. Um, you can also get weather information. I think, this, I think this does cost extra. I think you can get like one message per subscription. Otherwise, there's some sort of a charge, or you can sign up for an extra like add-in for that. Some differences, as I said, the Mini is limited functionality, but it's the lightest and the smallest. There's no map interface, so if you already have your smartphone out there, this might be the way to go. Um, the InReach Explorer does include all the preload DeLorme topo mouse, which is really nice, with a built-in digital compass, barometer, altimeter, and accelerometer. The InReach is just kind of the stripped-down version of the Explorer. No maps, no sensors. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of the different subscription models, and it seems like it gets co more complicated every time I look at this. <laughs> so a lot of times they're going to include things like, you know, 10, 40, or unlimited messages. The more you pay, the more messages you can do. I mean, I'm kind of in the mindset of I'm going to just pay for the safety one, and if I have to send another message and I spend $400 sending messages, that's fine. I'm not going to I'm not going to pay for a, a really expensive subscription pan just in case I need to send, you know, 40 messages that one time. I will just pay for it. But there are options available for that. And of course, if you if you <laughs> if you um, if you want to pay up front and do something like an annual contract, your monthly fee will go down. Or if you do something like the Freedom Plan, you only plan on using this three or four months or even one month, you can pay month to month or for the whole year. And again, with the each messages that are over a 50 cents a piece, I still feel like that's pretty cheap insurance to have even if you're going over your subscription plan. Uh, moving on to the spot, so the spot three, this is the one I was talking about that I was using that didn't have the best luck. Um, I still see a lot of people out there carrying them. It is a one-way communicator, meaning you can send messages out, but you can't receive them back. And there, there you have three preset messages, I believe, that you can send out. Do tracking and also the SOS button. The average battery life here is about 17 days when you're doing that 10-minute interval tracking. But again, it does come with a USB port, so you can charge it with an external battery if you needed to. And right now, you can get a 50% off with a mail-in rebate. And so after, after this presentation, I will, I will post this, not only the video, but I will also post the PowerPoint. And so if you want to do any more research or click around, I've tried to include as many hyperlinks as I can. 
um, for you to get at some more of this information. And the, the biggest thing for me with this one is there's no confirmation that messages or waypoints have been sent successfully. It's just like a hope and a prayer that you sent and all went well. Didn't, didn't really like that. Uh, they now are actually spots trying to also get in the game of the two-way communication. They've come out with a spot X of about $250. It's not a bad price point. Um, but again, this has no device integration. It does have some waypoint navigation. Average battery life is about 10 days with that 10 minute tracking with that USB charging if you need to charge again. So here, if you want to send messages, you have to send the little, the little QWERTY board to do that. I don't know, for some reason it reminds me of something like a Palm Pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like old school. And yeah, just some more information on the different subscription plans. With the spot three, it's just a pretty set um, either yearly or monthly plan. And we have options again with the spot X, depending on how much you think you're going to be using it for checking in and tracking. But they're all about the same price, somewhere in that like 11 to $20 range. And they have these flex plans um, that kind of allow you to do something like month to month. So if you're going on a big trip only one month that year, you can, you can just pay for the one month. So when I just kind of stumbled upon this one. I didn't even, I've never heard of it before. I'm calling it the new kid on the block. It's called the Somewhere. And it's about four ounces, which is probably about the size of my palm. And what this company is trying to do, it's a private company that also uses the Iridium Satellite Network, which is the same as the Garmin, so it has that global coverage. Um, they're trying to kind of find this middle ground between the kind of like bigger Garmin ones and the spot with more functionality. And how they're doing that is by you pretty much have to rely on the, the, the app that was on your phone to do things like the text messaging and the locating of your tracks and the weather forecasting. But, you know, a lot of times people already have that out there. They're using it as their camera. They're using it to read their books or whatever. Um, they're using it for their own navigation systems. And with this, they're saying that you get about 1,000 messages sent and received per charge. Comes again with the USB, the charging capabilities, so you can charge it up. But it's just kind of this really, like, small, lightweight version and on, on the actual device, there is a way to press the SOS and to see what the battery life is like. Um, but you basically rely on your phone for all of the other, other things. And so um, it will also tell you when your messages have been sent and received through your app, which I, I think is a, a, a good perk to have. And again, the data plans are really similar. They're having monthly plans or yearly plans with a set number of messages or pin drops um, along the way. So why would you want to have one of the, these PLBs? And to be honest, I, I haven't carried a PLB until the last couple of years. Maybe I'm just getting older and wiser. Um, but you just never know what's going to happen out there. I mean, I could walk across the street and get hit by a bus, but what happens if I get hit by it by a bus out there, nobody's going to be able to find me. Over the years, these devices have estimated to save more than 43,000 lives. It's a great way to keep your friends and family informed along the way. So like I was talking about, just make these check-ins part of your disaster aversion plans. You know, when you're out on hikes and just, just get in the habit, get in a routine of using these systems so you know how to use it. So when you do come to that situation where you actually do need help, it will be like second nature for you to pull that device out and actually use it. You're not fumbling around trying to figure it out on the spot. And it's a really great idea, especially for solo adventurers who spend a lot of time off trailer in the deep wilderness. Because if there's nobody within yelling distance, you're not going to be able to get any help. And it's just a great way to give your friends and family some peace of mind and to make sure that somebody's going to be be out there looking for you if something bad does happen. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. We're going to do a quick mic swap here.
All right. Thanks, Pam. Um, just a real quick introduction. My name is Greg Retschlog. I am the current, current president of Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue Unit. We refer to ourselves in the third person as IMSARU. Um, so that's generally how you'll hear us uh, refer to ourselves. Um, we're tasked with our, our charter for our group is to provide search and rescue services wherever and whenever needed, and um, as well as providing community safety education outdoor safety education. So that would very much uh, be this, what we're doing here tonight. Um, we're not a search and rescue group with any specific responsibility to cover any uh, particular area. We'll talk about it in a little bit, but that responsibility falls to law enforcement. We are merely a group of people, a group of volunteers, all volunteers, we have no paid staff, that is um, offering up our services to any law enforcement agency or anybody who's responsible for search and rescue that needs um, assistance, mainly in, in uh, people power, and then we bring a couple of extra skill sets um, to the table. Uh, we have man tracking people. Uh, we have uh, folks trained in technical rescue. We have search canines, uh, a bike team, and am I missing one? Oh, and now we're into UAS, yes. I keep forgetting they're, they're our newest group and uh, um, filling up with pilots quickly. I am curious, do we have any pilots in the room tonight? Anybody? No? Okay. So um, with that, I wanted just to kind of move into um, kind of where, where should we be using this SOS button. So Pam covered a lot of the functionality that goes into the satellite communicators and all that uh, extra stuff that we can get outside of the PLBs. Um, that's all great for communicating with your family, friends, kind of checking in, giving um, soft notices that you need help. Um, some of those will allow you just to say, hey, I'm not in desperate need here, but I really could use you to drive out here and pick me up or something like that. That's not what we're gonna talk about in this part of the presentation. This is the signal to the agencies that are out there that I'm in trouble and I need someone to come out and assist me. And that can be at varying levels of trouble. We'll go through some of those. So first and foremost, this uh, decision is really difficult. Um, it's hard to quantify all the things that can go wrong out there and who's trained to deal with them, who cannot deal with them. And so we're going to probably give you some ideas here, but very few definitive rules that says A, B, C. I work my way through the chart, and oh, yep, it says push the button. So we'll do our best to give you some scenarios and some things you can think about there. Go ahead. So first and foremost, let's err on the side of caution. I can only speak for our volunteer agency, but uh, there's most of the SAR work that's done out there is done by volunteers. And most of us as volunteers, we want to use our skill set. We want to help. And we would rather be called early and have to be turned around or show up and find out the situation isn't quite as desperate as we had feared rather than have somebody wait until it's very late in the game and ups our urgency level significantly, or worse, um, makes their condition unrecoverable, whether that's through death or some sort of uh, permanent disability. So error on the side of caution, and that is one of the things that we probably, most of us probably only have to coach for ourselves. If I'm pushing a PLB for myself, I'm probably going to be really reticent about it, if it's my family, if it's my friends, I'm going to be far more likely to hit that button, right? Because I'm, I want to get them some help. They're the ones that are like, no, 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 I'm going to be embarrassed. So we're going to probably have to help people through that situation too. So I appreciate you coming here for this presentation to kind of learn where we can help our friends out as well. Go ahead. All right, so the first one is, this is pretty easy, right? Anytime that self-rescue is not possible or very unlikely. I think most of us are going to recognize those situations, so I just put some examples here. Um, that would be lost with a limited chance to reorient or, or limited chance that you're going to encounter somebody. So this is particularly when you're off trail, off road, that sort of thing. Um, I like to think of the Owyhee Desert. Um, we've had times when we found out about people who were being rescued and they were only rescued because they had no way to notify anybody they were in distress. They were waiting to be noticed that they were missing, and maybe somebody from Idaho Power happened to be out there. So um, if you're in that situation, you're unlikely to be encountered by somebody. That's the time to use your I need help, the SOS button. And that's a pretty easy one, I think, for most people to kind of get their head around. Um, any injury that severely limits or ends your ability to move, that's pretty straightforward. 
um, gear for safe evac is lost or broken and it's non-functional, um, anything like that. And so in that, I would include if you're off-roading or just you know on forest service roads somewhere and your vehicle breaks down, that's your gear that's gonna get you somewhere. And if you're at the point where you're too far to walk out and this isn't a road that people are using very often, that's time to hit your SOS. Um, and then if you have some sort of weather event that occurs um, that makes it so that um, there is no way to safely evac, um, you know, whether that could be people hiking and suddenly you're getting rain, you're getting weather, and rivers are coming up and there is no way you're getting out with, you know, maybe some creeks you crossed earlier or whatever and you have really no expectation that they're coming down anytime soon. You didn't expect to be out that long, you're not prepped for it. All that is it's pretty, um, you know, easy to assess and say this situation is dire for me right now. Let's go ahead. So this is where it gets a little more complicated. What if something happened that's going to slow my extrication from wherever I'm at? Could be if I'm driving off somewhere in the back country or walking, um, however we got there. So I'm gonna put this under, we're slowed down, probably could get out, but what are the other circumstances that would say, hey, it's time to hit that button? So go ahead. So the first one would be a lack of needed meds or supplies. So you went out for the two hour hike and now something's happened to slow you down and now we're talking eight, 10 hours to evac. And maybe somebody's not even gonna notice that you're missing that amount of time. And you're like, I could get myself out, but I don't have whatever it is I need that is um, essential to um, my well-being or even you know, my life. Um, I got a very specific circumstance that we'll talk about later, but um, something like that um, could be um, any kind of you know, meds that are significant that will control, say, you know, heart meds, all those kinds of things. So if we're missing any of those supplies, and uh, we actually responded to a, a, uh, a situation like this, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Go ahead. Um, so if you have a medical condition um, you're dealing with and the deterioration is gonna lead to death and disability, um, you need to figure that out, okay? So you're slowed and you can't get out. So what type of medical conditions might deteriorate um, while we're in the back country as we're trying to fight our way out? So if we think if maybe we're slowed down from hiking out or getting out because of an injury, let's say to a limb, something essentially like a, a cut, a severe cut, anything like that. Um, if you're losing, say, circulation to a limb, anything like that, you wanna extract yourself quickly and we've already stated that we know we can't get out quickly, this is the time to hit that SOS. We don't want people risking disability when if we get into them uh, in a much quicker fashion and able to get them out, we'd suggest that you, it's time to activate your device. Um, another example might be just some sort of joint injury. You're walking, you blow out that knee, and you're thinking, I could get myself out of here, but are you doing more damage to that limb? That's a time to start thinking about, um, I probably could do some major damage here. Um, that is certainly warrants search and rescue assistance. Okay. And uh, one other one I'm thinking of is in the winter, we're getting into the colder months now, frostbite. If you start to have problems with limbs and you're like, well, I could still get myself out of here, I'm not real sure where I'm gonna be at with this frostbite by the time I get out of here, that's the time to hit your SOS and maybe start working on just keeping yourself warm and uh, in, in as best shape you can. Uh, go ahead. Um, so then what about environmental conditions that you're not prepped for? Uh, one of these I can think of is a search um, that we actually did a few years ago where we had snowmobilers out very reasonable conditions. They were capable in the areas that they were uh, sledding, enjoying themselves, and they weren't expecting weather to come in as bad as it did. Um, snow came in, blowing snow, that by the time they wrapped back around to an area that was exposed, they encountered a hard crust on a, on a very uh, kind of slanted surface, um, you know, of a hillside, and their sleds were starting to basically, you know, slide off, and they were unable to ride the road anymore. That sort of thing, um, they would have been able to probably go up and around and try and work their way through, find different areas that weren't as exposed to the wind, et cetera, but they weren't prepped to really be sledding for that amount of time. 
may not have had the fuel to do it. Any of that kind of stuff would have been pushing it. So that's the time to activate. And in none of these instances that I'm talking about, these are a little more historic before um, people were really starting to use these devices. So none of these actually resulted in somebody pushing an SOS. But had they had a beacon, I would have said that was the time to use it. Um, another example would be the, uh, the one I was talking about with the, the Swan Creeks, all that kind of stuff. You crossed them, they were fine, everything was great. And then you got that storm that came through and brought everything up and safe evac. Um, you might be able to kind of work your way around big distances, all that kind of stuff, find new paths, whatever you need. But now with that slow evac, and you're probably not carrying everything you need, you weren't expecting to be out that long, it might be time to hit that SOS. Um, thinking also of uh, recently we had an incident of somebody was out driving with the family, and the roads that they were on, suddenly hit by rain, they're diving along in the Forest Service roads, everything's great until they had landslides on both sides of them. It traps the vehicle, they're fine, there's no real threat to their life, but their evac, they're going to have to wait to figure out some way to pick their way through this situation, if, at, if they can get through at all. Um, and you got kids with you and things that you hadn't been prepped for to be out that long. Um, so here we're again talking about a good time to hit the SOS. Go ahead. So this one here um, kind of feeds into that same situation, um, but a little bit different. It's a little bit of nuance here. Um, a medical issue that is difficult to evaluate in the field and could have m severe consequences. So one of these that jumps out in my mind, um, there's a book out there by, written by a, a canyon guide from the Grand Canyon, a river guide. And he spends a whole chapter talking about dealing with head injuries in the backcountry. And we're not talking about the head injuries where it's quite obvious that somebody's got a cut or, you know, a concussion or whatever. But somebody takes a, a blow to the head, and now you've got that moment of thinking, for those of you with maybe a little bit of advanced first aid training and things, you're not sure if that, even though they're okay right now, if an hour from now there's going to be some swelling that's going to make it a dire life event. He's talked about times when he's evac'd people, called for the helicopter because they carry ground-to-air radios, and sent somebody to the hospital, and they get there just in time to save a life. They're there because they need that immediate care in the emergency room um, because they do have that swelling that's impossible to see in the backcountry. He's also pulled the trigger on that and sent pe perfectly healthy people out. But you don't know. In this case, if you have somebody who takes a, any kind of a sharp blow to a spot in the head, I would recommend it's time to call SOS, even if they're standing there going, no, really, I'm okay. Because that can go from zero to death in like an hour. And we have no way in the backcountry of knowing whether that person's going to be okay or not. And by the time you see the symptoms, it's way too late. So, and you'll see later with the timing on this thing that we kind of have to really anticipate with this stuff. Um, another couple of examples for that. Um, think of somebody with maybe has a minor cardiac event and it's a friend and you didn't even know they had history and you're talking to them and they're like actually it was just a small thing I think it's really resolved itself and they're telling you about how they have cardiac history and you're like that's one I can't evaluate in the field I know nurses and doctors who would have no ability without equipment to evaluate that in the field that person probably needs to go and the fear should never be if they get to the hospital and there's nothing wrong with them somebody's going to be really mad. I guarantee you that in that sort of instance, we would pull the trigger the same way that we're advising you to. Um, one more example of that might be something that I call a brain attack. And that would be somebody who, for no real apparent reason, suddenly has this altered state, whatever it is. Could be something where they're just not talking right. They're, they're maybe not able to focus mentally. Something's really off them or maybe even some sort of motor skill issue and then it resolves itself. None of us, no matter how medically trained, have the ability to evaluate that situation in the backcountry and that again can go from zero to very, very severe to death very quickly and there's no way to kind of clear that person short of a hospital. That would be one that I would also really give serious thought to pushing the SOS. You can go ahead. So um, the last one here is 
when don't we activate? So there's a couple of big don'ts in there. Um, we're never looking to save gear, vehicles, um, that there's no threat to human life, human safety. So two people are out driving their individual vehicles on forest service roads. One of the vehicles is stuck, disabled somehow. You can get in with the friend, drive home. Um, our group doesn't rescue vehicles. Most of the search and rescue units I know don't rescue vehicles. If we're called for a real emergency, somebody say is stranded with no hope of getting out, and we go in and we, we generally are only gonna focus on the people. The lives that are there, we'll get you out. Occasionally, we may help with the vehicle if it's a simple problem, but for the most part, vehicles are not our problem. Those are the, the problem of the owner. Same thing with ATVs, snowmobiles, all that kind of stuff. We're gonna get the people out. The vehicle is up to them to deal with. So we would never push that to, um, to take care of our vehicle. Um, we would never pr uh, push the SOS or advise somebody to do so to prevent being late for, and you can fill that in, right? I've got a flight back from the Sawtooth to the East Coast. Can't miss that. Family's waiting, whatever. Um, there's this thing we can throw in there, though. What if late means SAR is going to be notified, right? We did everything right, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. One of our keys is when we're going out somewhere, we let somebody responsible know where we're going, when we're going to be back, and what to do if we don't come back. Okay, and somebody responsible is a really important thing, and I got a, read a great story recently about that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, so basically any time that it's not a threat to you personally, it's maybe a threat to your ego or to your job status, um, anything like that, that's not search and rescue's place to be taking you out of, so please do not use the device for that. So basically, you can say anytime there's no threat to life, limb, or eyes. And I use that term because at one time I was told that's how the National Guard decides whether to take a mission or not. Can you justify it as a threat to life, limb, or eye? Um, I don't know if that's actually their uh, check sheet, but uh, I always thought it was neat that they decided to tack eye on there as well. But, um, so the next one's complicated. What about it? You got an injured animal, right? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I can stand up here and say, we're in the business of rescuing humans. Um, we have taken calls, um, not in my time with the unit, I have never been able to respond to one of these calls, but our group has taken calls from sheriff's organizations, whatever, saying, do you have any skill set at all for rescuing a stranded horse, um, dogs, um, the, um, the recent news, uh, I think out at Swan Falls, somebody had a dog fall off the overlook out there, you know, above Swan Falls, and Boise Fire went out there, you know, and we're not the fire department, we're not usually taking kittens out of trees. Um, the, the answer there is probably, um, there may be groups that are gonna be pretty disappointed if you push the PLB. The spot and the in reach, this is where they come in really handy because first of all, when the sheriff finds out there's a horse in distress, they may be sympathetic to that. And the best part is they may not be looking to us because we, our technical rescue team doesn't have any harnesses that fit horses. There may be groups that do that. And so they'll direct that and channel that correctly. So um, in the PLB, I would say if you're out with animals and you know we all have the concerns for our animals that's the time to maybe put that into your decision whether i'm carrying a plb or whether i'm carrying a uh, satellite communicator so um, i don't want to stand up here and say that no you don't push it for there but i i could see where you may get some grief if you push a full-on plb and it's going through the big resources right it's going to go through the air force um, all that kind of stuff so go ahead all right so Let's move on to now what, what can we expect? We push the button and now like what happens? So uh, the first thing we got to realize is that what Pam talked about is the Air Force versus a private agency that's going to take your call. Both of them are going to work hard to get you a response as fast as possible. And I don't have enough experience with these to say that they're equal or how they would go about their job, how fast that would happen. Um, but I can say that everything I've read 
and everything I've seen, the IERCC, which is the private version, that's where your inReach and your spot go to, um, it's a very professional organization. It's not just that, a hatcheted together thing. Um, it's, it's well set up, well funded, and all that kind of stuff. But the AFRCC has got the full might of the US government military spending behind it. That's a group of folks that sit in Florida, and they take those um, calls off the, the uh, uh, PLBs. And the big difference between these two groups is that the e IERCC has no assets available to them for search and rescue. All they can do is direct your distress call to the proper agency. So they're going to probably get that call. And one of the first things they're going to do is look for your contact to call and say, is this real? Is this person actually out somewhere where they could be in distress? And they're going to want to vet that and make sure that this is a real activation, somebody that they should be kind of raising the alarm for. The AFRCC is going to receive a beacon signal, which is the international, hey, I'm in trouble. There's really nobody they can call. I don't know. I wasn't able to find anything. When you register a PLB, do you register a contact person as well as yourself? OK, so that may allow them to vet whether or not this is a real activation. Um, one of the uh, things I ran across in researching this stuff was that the, uh, not long ago, um, one of our um, fellow agencies, we're part of the Mountain Rescue Association, which is a, a, a national and actually international group of, of search and rescue groups. And uh, one of our uh, fellow agencies in, in the Rocky Mountain area in, uh, in Colorado um, kept getting a notification of a uh, PLB being set off. And they would, every time that thing would light up, they were out chasing it around. And they were trying to locate this particular PLB. And it would activate for a while and then not activate. And then it would turn off. So what you said about a one-time use has got me really confused about this particular story. And this group, this kept happening. And it kept happening all over in their area in the backcountry. And they were like, they knew it was a you know, an inadvertent or a nefarious activation. And they kept chasing this thing around until one day it went off inside a doctor's office in town. And they're like, we got it. And they raced down there, and there's a guy sitting there with his PLB. And he had never registered it. So they didn't know who he was, so there was no way they could contact anybody and say, is this a false or a true activation? And what had happened was the guy thought he was given for his birthday or Christmas, an avalanche beacon. So he was skiing, turning on his beacon, skiing around, and then he'd get done, and apparently there's a way to deactivate these. And they finally found him experimenting while he was stuck in the waiting room at his doctor's office. And informed him that had he been buried in an avalanche, he would have been found by search and rescue well after the fact, and his friends would have had no ability to track him. So there's lots wrong with that story. but. Uh, Anyways, that's the difference between um, the, the uh, PLB because you have to go out and overtly register it. And I can't imagine having a spot and not registering, not them not being able to get a hold of you because it, you use them so differently. So the key takeaway here is that the AFRCC does have ac uh, access to federal search and rescue groups. So that would be military, so National Guard and Coast Guard as well as um, they do have the ability to activate the Civil Air Patrol. Um, so if somebody's contact information was for a person who knew that they were on a flight that day, they were taking their small aircraft up, and that was activated, hopefully that information will be relayed from the contact person to say, yeah, they're flying right now. And that would automatically push the AFRCC to activating the Civilian Air Patrol, which is much better at finding downed aircraft um, than local resources because you may not know exactly where that is immediately. Um, but uh, quickly they'll transition over to ground search. So the other thing that's um, really nice actually with the, with the satellite communicators is we as a search and rescue group can get an idea of what kind of urgency we need to apply to this. So if it's just not a straight up SOS, I don't know what that is, I have to go with all the urgency that that's, you know, we can muster. Um, and assess 
you know, what we've got for personnel, what we got for resources, what we're looking at for weather. Whereas if we can get the information from somebody that it's like, hey, this is a problem because you know, we've, got, we've lost gear or whatever happened and we're hunkered down and waiting for somebody to get us, but we're okay for now. Um, that's gonna be kind of a big difference um, by which unit you use and what you can expect for people rolling out. Basically, you're gonna get the best and fastest response if you hit the SOS because without any explanation because we don't know what we're chasing then. So go ahead. Okay, so SAR is very location dependent. So in Idaho, law, local law enforcement is responsible for all search and rescue. So most likely that's gonna mean the county sheriff. There's a few exceptions. If you're in the city, it doesn't really apply to what we're talking about here. You get maybe Boise City. Um, and if you're in a national, or uh, sorry, in, on federal um, parks land, so it has to be a national park, which we don't have, but we do have national monuments. So it would defer over to the federal government, the park service, if you were say in Craters of the Moon. Um, but otherwise, it's gonna be the county sheriff. And the group that the county sheriff has available to them is going to be extremely uh, different depending on where you're at. So in Boise County, they have no search and rescue group that belongs specifically to them. We're kind of the de facto group for, uh, for Boise County. Uh, most of the other counties have some amount of a search and rescue group. Some are very good at it. Some of them are very people limited just because a lot of our counties are big. Lots of mountains, lots of everything, and very few people. So where you're trying to pull volunteers, um, very difficult. So we may be in there to help, but you can see how that would affect your timing of response in that has to go over to the sheriff. The sheriff rounds up his crew. Then he finds out he doesn't have enough people in their crew, and maybe they forward the call over to us. Um, so... It's going to affect the time just based on where you're at and what they have for search and rescue resources. Um, and the exception to that is the Division of Aeronautics. Um, whenever there's a missing aircraft, they're going to get involved and they are a statewide agency. So they can kind of, you know, push some resources and help out with that sort of thing. But um, most of us here, it sounds like we're ground-based. Um, so we're going to be kind of subject to the local search and rescue groups. Uh, let's see. Um, and then the final part of that is the local search and rescue groups. Um, a lot of them have their, their specialties. They're really good at something and not so good at other things. So like our group, um, we've got ground pounders all over the place. We can, if you need people marching down trails, all that kind of stuff, that's great. Maybe not so strong on motorized resources. Vehicles, cars, trucks, we can probably provide. ATVs, snowmobiles, not so much. We depend on other agencies for that sort of stuff. Um, and some other private people to help us out with that. If you go to Elmore County, they kill it on motorized stuff and, and equestrian, right? If you need those sorts of resources, they can round them up and they can get them going. Finding ground pounders, they may be deferring over and having IMSRU come in and help them out. So um, your response time is gonna be really dependent on what county you're in. And if you know how many counties are in the Sawtooth? Anybody know? I think there's five. So. Pretty amazing, depending on where you're at, you could get a very different response just by going over one ridge line. So go ahead. All right, so um, air resources. That's kind of what most of us, I think, picture. We push SOS, and at any time, the helicopter's coming over, dangling somebody that's just going to scoop us up, get us to the hospital, right? So um, not always that far from the truth, but uh, there is a time delay in there. So air resources in Idaho. Um, basically, the availability is going to be dependent on flying conditions. And I've got a specific example, which leads to the note there, which is local conditions may not be the problem for flying ability. What's the big problem we have here in the valley? It's winter time. It happened today. Inversions. Yeah. So we've had times when we've been up in the mountains, and we really need a helicopter for evacuating somebody out of the backcountry, and they can't leave the valley. And that includes the National Guard and the air med services, they cannot fly if the valley is capped with one of those gunky inversions. So it's frustrating because you're sitting up there in this beautiful weather and if they could just get out of the valley. So, um, you know, the, 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 the alternative to that is hopefully there's something based somewhere else that's not socked in. But in general, I think if you've lived here long enough, you know that when the inversions hit, a lot of times they take over all of like western, or sorry, eastern Oregon and, and you know, most of Idaho, southern Idaho at least. So that's one thing to consider is 
if you're getting frustrated because you're like, why can't they get air resources in, there may be other things that are going on outside of where you're at. What do we have for resources in Idaho that we can count on? The National Guard offers up Blackhawks and Lakotas, um, two different types of helicopters, both of them used for search and rescue, both of them can do the thing with the putting the cable down on the winch and grabbing a hold of people and bringing them back up. Um, the Blackhawks a little more capable of taking a lot of people, um, so if you have multiple people that need to be evac for some reason, um, the, that would probably be your choice. The Lakota would have to make multiple trips. Um, we have the Air Medical Services locally, Life Flight and Air St. Luke's. Um, they do not have search and rescue as kind of part of their operating plan. Um, if they go out and search for somebody before that person's location is known, that's out of the goodness of their hearts, as it were. That's something they're doing just because they want to be part of the community and help out. They have done that, and I've also seen them turn down assignments. It just depends on where they're at with resources and things like that. Um, because if you can imagine, if they search and they don't find anybody, or they don't put anybody into their helicopter, that's all money that they're burning out of the account, so to speak. So, um, and then the biggie here that you guys may not have heard of, and uh, should be applauded every time we talk about them, is Two Bear Air up in Whitefish, Whitefish Montana. I believe that's Flathead County. Um, there is a philanthropist up there who lives in that county and went to the sheriff and said, um, sounds like you're struggling with search and rescue. What do you need? What can I help you with? And he said, could you fix my helicopter? Because helicopters can resolve these situations quickly. The guy said, how about if we just build a whole helicopter unit for you and I'll staff it and I'll pay for it and it'll just be free for you to use. And they are professional. They are search and rescue only. Um, they carry a medic. They carry a technician that'll go down on on the cable, they can winch. Um, they will pick up search and rescue people and move them around. They'll do whatever's needed if they're available. And they will fly, not quite to Boise, but their range is all the way down, um, coming down to uh, kind of the central mountains. So they'll go into the Sawtooth, they'll go into the Lost River Range. Um, they've been into the, the southern Sawtooth with us to help us out. A phenomenal agency. I, I can't even imagine how much money it put that, to put that together to keep it going. And this guy just was like, hey, the county needs it and I got money, let's, let's do it. So really, really cool resource. Um, and not uncommon to be used uh, way down here. Um, so the local SAR knowledge of those resources. So this Two Bear Air, they've been down here a lot. And as, in search and rescue terms, you know, like a couple of times in the last few years, They've actually just come in, and they're the only ones that came in. They took care of the situation before the ground pounders ever got out there. Um, so if your local SAR agency from whatever county knows about them, and Custer County uses them in spades um, because of the difficulty they have, big area, right, few people, um, but there are other counties that don't know they exist or don't have that relationship, and they're like, well, I, I can't imagine calling Two Bear from Whitefish, Montana. Um, and it just depends on who's bending their ear saying, Maybe you want to give those guys a call. So that's going to factor into how fast you get evac right? Um, and then uh, the available flight crew, if we go through the, the National Guard, if you catch it on a Tuesday afternoon when everybody's on base, pretty good chance that as soon as the guard gets the call and the governor gives the okay, that they're going to field the crew, put them in the helicopter, and get going pretty quickly. If it's Saturday night, nobody's really on base, they don't staff those helicopters 24-7. They're looking to call those uh, men and women up and bring them in and put together a full crew. So that's going to take some time and it's going to delay uh, any evac. So, go ahead. So the bottom line, um, expect a minimum of four hours for rescuers to arrive. Okay, we're going to talk about a uh, specific example and the person who did the report on it uh, was one of the people rescued and he estimated at exactly four hours. Um, so with that, um, why four hours? So it could be shorter than that. If everything aligns for you, it could be as little as maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Um, but I wouldn't expect anything less than four. The minute you hit SOS, start prepping yourself for four hours minimum to be taking care of somebody, taking care of yourself, doing whatever it is you need to get yourself through till help arrives. So you can see this is going to cycle back to factoring in when do we hit SOS. If you think in four hours this situation could be dire, you better push now because that's how long it's going to take before somebody gets to you. Okay? So um, I did the four-hour calculation just kind of knowing what our group is like. 
Um, you can picture probably about a half hour from the time that the thing goes up to the satellites, the information is pulled down to whichever agency is receiving it. They check it out, they vet it, they move it along, they probably make a few phone calls, they're going to call your, your contact person, say, hey, is this person actually out and about that you know of right now? And they're like, yeah, they're out in the sawtooth right now. If they pushed it, it's probably a real activation. By the time they, let's say that takes them a half hour to turn it around, get it off to their local, whoever is locally responsible, um, they get a hold of that person, that person's dispatch, that county's dispatch, is going to move it along to whoever's supposed to go in and vet that. So there may be a sheriff's deputy who drives to your location if they believe you're out on, in a vehicle. Um, it's going to take them quite a while, not only to get that dispatch, find somebody and move them into your location, or to get out the SAR people, right? All of us are volunteers. We don't staff a building at all. So when we get the phone call, um, it's already been through the sheriff's department. They've vetted it as, yeah, this is something we want to respond to. They maybe call their own SAR group, or if it's Boise County, they call us. It takes us, our goal is to be heading out with our trucks loaded with people and, and ready to move down the road within an hour. So we get a text message, says it's time to go. We throw our gear, get into our vehicles, drive to our compound, get all of our stuff loaded up, and we're gone in an hour. So now we're already an hour and a half deep in this, right? You can picture from Idaho. If we're looking at Boise County, we're coming from Boise. It's gonna take us a while to drive there, right? So let's say it takes us an hour to drive to where you're at. You're on foot down the trail, maybe an hour and a half to hike into you if we don't have helicopter resources. We're already at four hours, and that would be, I can tell you from my experience, that would be a miraculous turnaround time for getting somebody who's actually off, you know, on foot somewhere. So expect four hours uh, minimum, plan for as much as 12. You could be deep in, into the you know, back country somewhere. By the time we roll people out, it could be a three hour drive. If we don't have a helicopter lift to get us up into the Sawtooth, right? We're rolling in an hour, three hours to get to the trailhead. We're already four hours deep and we haven't started hiking yet. Okay, and that's four hours of our time. That's not even the dispatch moving the call around and stuff. So, so plan for as much as 12 and then um, like I said, factor that time delay into whether or not you're going to press SOS. So, okay, perfect. Go ahead and uh, advance. So let's talk a couple, of, uh, couple of examples we've had. Go ahead. So we had some UTD riders stranded in Boise County, so kind of off of the backside of, of, uh, of Bogus Basin, and they had a satellite communication device. I believe it was a spot. Uh, two gentlemen riding their UTDs. Um, would encounter snow, and they knew they were going to break out on a road, uh, well, a real road, a plowed road, eventually. And it was spring, right, that shoulder season when the north-facing stuff doesn't melt out. And one of them had extremely limited mobility, so every time they hit snow, the one guy would get his ATV through it, and then he would hook up the winch, and they would pull the other guy through, because they were like, well, we're so close, we should keep going, right? And this happens to us a lot with calls we make, or that we attend to, and eventually they got exhausted, they know going back is miserable, they're not sure what's in front of them, and they set off the spot. So in this case, it worked pretty well. Um, it was in 2015, I believe. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't at that time thinking enough to like, I really need to learn about these devices. So we didn't question them a lot about where the information was going. So what I can answer is, was their information just sent a soft SOS to family and saying, hey, um, I think we can get out of here. Um, we're okay, but we're stranded. We definitely need somebody to pluck us out of here. Um, when we arrived, we found out that they were in that situation where um, they were okay now, but they both needed medical supplies, and one of them had dire need of medical supplies that was an imminent threat to his life, and they had none of that with them. And so that was good time to use their satellite communicator. That data either went through the family, the family called the sheriff and said they need help, here's the coordinates they're sending us, or it went through the operations center and through to the sheriff. Um, it was difficult to get to them. It took us quite a while. Um, we're dealing with the same snow. We're trying to pound through there. Um, and then we're also working with trying to figure out how to get to them by roads that aren't mapped, right? It's great to go out and drive forest service and abandon logging roads, but trying to find those. So we're trying to do a combination of maps overlaying and we don't have them in our hands. Our base camp can pull up some aerial views and looking like, hey, there's a, you're at this thing, maybe if you take this road to the left or whatever. Um, 
Do you recall how long it took us to get to these gentlemen? It was, yeah, minimum of three hours from the time we started hiking. Um, and it was at night, uh, it was snowing, just all kinds of things like that. So it worked, we found them. Um, there were a couple of ghost spots that we chased that the, they were slowly honing in where their actual location was. We don't know if they were moving or if we were just getting poor data at start. Um, there's different ways to translate coordinates, and so we could have been messing up and just kind of misconnecting on which systems and everything were being used. But um, it worked out. Um, they ended up being winched out by a National Guard helicopter, and, and you know, all was well. But a good activation of the spot system, um, but showed that the kind of the complications, by the time we actually got them out, uh, the National Guard was having trouble getting out of the valley at the time. We didn't get them out till the next morning. They were obviously driving their ATVs the day before. So it um, took them a while. I think they probably weren't back at their vehicles where they could get the supplies they needed um, for probably maybe 12 to 14 hours from when they left their vehicle. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we had a solar, solo hiker overdue with a satellite communication device. He never pushed SOS for whatever reason. We'll never know. Um, but his, uh, his uh, spot, he wasn't real fond of it. He was made to carry it by his family. He just it wasn't, he, he kind of liked the idea of being out in the wilderness, you know, and, and doing the thing, getting after it. Um, but fortunately for us, um, at least to aid our search somewhat, um, it was set on an auto send mode. It was sending hourly updates of his location so we could kind of see the last location that we got information from his spot device. Um, so in this case, we actually had to call and query spot or the IERCC to get that information and say, do you have anything from the spot? Because there was no SOS. The family's reporting him overdue and said he has a spot device and they sent us the breadcrumb trail. So, um, you know, just kind of a, a side note with that there, that when something happens where maybe you're not able to push help, having breadcrumbs is, is you know, going to help the SAR agencies find you. Go ahead. And a final example, um, we had an injured hiker in the Sawtooth. That happened uh, just this summer. Um, this person activated a PLB for their partner who was injured. Ankle injury was not severe enough to really need, like, you know, like, immediate medical care. They could have gone to the doctor if it happened to them in downtown Boise, but they were off trail in the middle of the sawtooth. Activated the beacon. Um, the initial information we got from the AFRCC um, sent a air medical helicopter. St. Luke's was willing to volunteer and go and look with no uh, guarantee of reimbursement. Um, they flew until they were low on fuel circling the spot with the initial set of coordinates that they got and eventually uh, exhausted their fuel, went to Stanley to pick up fuel and heard that over the radio that the National Guard was on the way. So the idea was let the medical helicopter sit in Stanley, let the National Guard do their thing for a while. They got an up updated set of coordinates from the AFRCC, flew right to the people. Turns out they were only two miles off, but even in a helicopter circling in one spot looking down um, and the people were across the ridge line, um, just two miles away, you would think if you're up in the air, um, never saw them. There was no indication where they were. National Guard flew right to them, dropped uh, an attendant down, winched them both up, brought them into Stanley. Air Medical checked them out. They re refused care, um, got a ride to their vehicle, and drove to wherever they needed to to get a, uh, an ankle problem taken care of. Um, that one was uh, listed on the, Pam found that for us, and uh, the gentleman posted a, uh, just a story about that, so probably to get his, uh, his beacon replaced. <laughs> And uh, I love it because rarely in search and rescue do we get to know the end of the story. In this case, we actually got to see the rest of what the rest of the story was there. So go ahead. So some final thoughts. Um, the SATCOM and the PLB is still not a replacement for leaving your plans. So leave a destination time of return and leave it with someone, well, I guess I caught, chopped it off there, someone responsible. Okay, and a real quick story about that is a uh, sister agency down in, in uh, Utah, a uh, woman was hiking in the Escalante she was solo. She was staying at a hotel in Escalante or uh, Boulder, I guess it was. She went up to the clerk and said, here's where I'm going hiking. If I'm not back tonight to get my room, can you please call the authorities? He said, sure. She takes off. She gets a little bit lost. Then she gets scared. She falls, hurts herself, and realizes she can't self-evac, but she's like, at least I told the clerk. The problem was she hunkered down for that night, figuring tomorrow morning the cavalry arrives. 
The clerk never told anybody. So someone responsible that will call. You're sure they'll take care of you, right? He had no skin in the game. He never called. Like four days later, they wondered why she didn't get her crap out of the hotel room, and they called the authorities and said, this woman's never come back. And that's when the clerk was like, <laughs> playing slingshots back there. Um, that's why um, somebody finally went out, and they fortunately found her still alive and lived to tell the story. But um, got to make sure it's somebody who's really going to you know, look out for you. Register your PLB, the story from the guy running around with it, right? They could have saved SAR a lot of headache if they just registered that. They could have called and said, why are we getting this from your PLB? So. And rescue is not immediate. Prep for an emergency. So get the first aid training. Go out there, and if you're going to be out in the back country, at least get you know, some basic first aid stuff. And you, know, you can, if you want, step that up to that wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder type stuff. But uh, get some training and then carry the proper gear with you so that if it does come to that and you have to hunker down, you're on the two-hour hike and you're stuck there now for four hours waiting for rescue, that you can take care of yourself for those four hours. Okay. Is that hey, your yeah, portion so there? We'll do a little, another little swap for just a couple minutes to finish up. If you want to stand up there with me and sure. answer some questions and stuff too. So that is a good segue into my last slide. So always be thinking about that other safety equipment you should be carrying. Prepare for that four plus hours. I carry um, a few extra pounds of gear on every little trip I do, be it a day hike or, or, a, we or a weekend backpacking trip or a 30 day trip in the Sierras. I'm always carrying a whistle, a headlamp, a space blanket, uh, a little bit of extra food. And again, make your trip plan and stick to it. Carry those 10 essentials. So with that, that's the end of our presentation. We want to thank all of you for coming out and supporting both of our organizations. Um, if you didn't sign up in the back, please do. That will keep you informed of the other events that are happening. As I said, this is part of a series. And so once a month through the spring, I'll be hosting a presentation. And for the most of them, um, I'm not going to be speaking. So you'll get to hear somebody else up here talking about cool things. There are um, some flyers and stickers and things on the back, grab those. There's also the schedule for the rest of the presentation series. Um, and with that, do we have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question. When a search and rescue is started, how is it decided if it's going to be done on foot or in the air? So that decision is complicated, and that's going to mean, uh, be made by the agency that is taking the call. So um, I can tell you that in Custer County, they pull the trigger on a helicopter rather quickly. If they can keep their land-based people from going out and they have helicopter resources, they'll go for that pretty quickly. Um, but it really is very dependent on which county you happen to be in at the time and how comfortable they are with their current SAR arrangement, all the people they have, or with uh, maybe the relationships they have with the helicopter people. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Are there any costs involved if somebody comes to rescue you? Okay, great question. Are there any costs involved when somebody comes to rescue you? I'm glad you asked that because my cohorts back there are smiling because I did fail to mention that. Um, <laughs> Our agency never charges for a rescue, um, and not only our agency here in Boise, but all of our sister agencies in the Mountain Rescue Association, that is a mantra that we carry everywhere. We never charge for a rescue. We want never to have anybody hesitate to call for help from one of our agencies because they think they're going to be charged. Um, most sheriff's uh, agencies in the state of Idaho do not charge. They're, I know of no agencies that have a we will charge mantra. Um, however, when you start involving, if you get lost and say you jump out of the ropes at Bogus Basin, if Bogus Basin comes to find you, they will charge you because it's expensive to run snow cats, et cetera. Um, we help out up there. So if it happens to be us who finds you, it's free. National Guard picks you up in a helicopter, it's free. If the Air Med puts you in their helicopter, that's anything but free. If I could, real quick, um, an example of that, we had a gentleman fall while climbing, um, an injury, but not so bad that he couldn't get in a car and survive the ride 
back or down to Wood River to get medical treatment. His care was to get picked up by the National Guard and he was dropped off in Stanley and taken by a ground ambulance on one of these, the, the local agencies up there, pretty cheap to be, jump in the ambulance. He ended up in the ER with probably a $200 ambulance bill. Similar situation, but somebody with a bit more severe injury. National Guard plucked them out of the sawtooth, takes them to Stanley. From Stanley, he got into an air medical helicopter, flew to Boise for his ER experience, and I believe that helicopter trip was probably somewhere around twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. Big difference. What about life flight? Uh, life flight and air, uh, and and St. Luke's both fall into that category. So um, they are very expensive. So the minute you get into an air med helicopter, that's where your your uh, you really really hope that your insurance is good, and that's why I would always recommend having an air med. Uh, a uh, membership. They're very cheap and they'll save a huge cost. So. That is correct. And both of those agencies uh, will uh, take that insurance, no matter which group you bought it from. Um, yeah. And that sort of stuff goes into training mostly volunteer EMTs and things like that. So they even channel that money to good causes. Yeah, and just talking about the life flight insurance, in the springtime, ITA actually um, uh, does a, a kind of a group policy where um, you can sign up as individuals for your life flight insurance, but signing up through the Idaho Trails Association, you can get a discount on that. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's probably like 20 bucks cheaper than if you would sign up on yourself, and I believe we do that in April. Again, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll find out when you can get your discounted life flight insurance. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick thought. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I was recently in a remote South Pacific island on a backcountry trip. We had a uh, sat phone and a DeLorem, and we tried numerous times, um, and they never worked. Never. Any thoughts? Any like what? The DeLorem got out once, once on an eight-day trip after numerous attempts. Where were you? Vanuatu. It's the remote chain of islands in the South Pacific, uh, east of Australia, south of Fiji. Okay, yeah. Uh, my only assumption would probably have to do with satellite configuration. Um, at the time you were trying to do it, I don't know what time of day you were trying to do it. That is getting a little bit south, but not that far south that I wouldn't think that you would be able to pick it up. And, you know, at least with the, um, with the satellite systems for, for all of these, they do have international coverage because they use, you know, different satellite systems from, like, Russia and China and that. So my only assumption would be some sort of gap in satellite coverage at the time you were trying it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Or. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, sorry. Was it cloudy? Yeah. Maybe it was too cloudy. Yeah. Quick question. Okay. You were gonna recommend Well, most of my friends are, are kind of weekend warriors like I am, and I would probably suggest something like the Garmin InReach. Any of those versions, depending on your tech savviness. If you want to go light and fast, I get the little mini guy. If you want to have that um, kind of Swiss Army knife, go with the Explorer. And again, this is just going to be a really great tool for doing so many different things. Communicating while you're out there, having people track you. You know, like he was saying, what if you get in that situation where you physically can't hit the SOS button, at least they'll be like, hey, this guy hasn't moved for four days. <laughs> Maybe we should go pick him up and they'll at least see where you've gone. Um, and also just those other kind of comforts of having a, a mapping system if you needed it, um, things of that nature. I mean, if you were going to be doing something more extreme and you wanted to have something that's, that you know is going to work for sure, one of the PLBs, the ACR units were recommended over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, Steve. Okay, so the question is about what's the likelihood of a canyon messing with the signal going out? I would say the likelihood is really likely. Um, <laughs> 
With the PLB, because of that stronger transmission, I think you're going to be okay. But like I was talking about with um, even something like the spot, if you're going to have especially a limited sky view, I would keep that in mind when you're trying to send out your signal. So if you can get out anyway, even like halfway up the rim or something, I would suggest doing that to make sure. And also coming back to the what would be the, the, the unit you would pick, anything that confirms your your message has been sent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've sent a message from the Owyhee River, mm -hmm. pretty far down the Owyhee River, on the Delorman Reach. Okay. Works great. Great. He said it worked great. Okay. Hi, Frank. Through all this, it seems like there would be really important for So the question um, has to do with if you get into a situation where you need to have some kind of two-way communication, talking about the extent of your injuries or something like that, um, are you kind of asking, like, what are the recommendations from, like, a SAR or? Or are they working more towards that or, like, you're, you know, like going in and not really being needed? Sure. Oh, so you're talking about the actual companies building the systems, having kind of this two-way communication? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I would think so, uh, especially, yeah, they, the, a lot of these models now have this two-way communication, and you can send out text messages via the app on your phone and the old system of up, 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 A, over, 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 C. Um, that, that you can send messages back and forth. Yeah, you can receive messages back from them if, if it's going out, yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any situations where it would be recommended to both carry both a PLB and a satellite communicator? Um, my gut, my gut response would be um, if you think you need to carry both, carry both. <laughs> Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I could see the advantage of carrying both, and honestly, they're not very heavy. You can get a PLB that weighs like four to eight ounces, and same with the messenger units. So you could. I guess it just depends on, on what your comfort level is. I would say if you were going to do something more extreme, but you wanted to have that comfort of being able to check in, um, like a big mountaineering trip or a big, like, scary whitewater trip or something, then it could be nice to have both. But do you have any comments on the? No, I think that kind of covers it. Um, you know, for us, if we get an SOS, um, it's helpful to have more information, but um, we were really experienced at rolling out with limited information. It's 95% of what we do is we show up and the situation's very different than we thought. Um, and we're usually able to, you know, accommodate anything. So um, the extra communication would be helpful to SAR, but it, uh, I don't think it would change the type of response you would get much. Yeah. Yeah, you do have a better signal. I think I think there's there's so many things that it depends on like knowing what conditions you're going to be out in. If you're going to be in conditions that are like you're in a super dense forest or you're in a canyon or something where you're worried about the signal going out, you might want to carry both. If you're doing a polar exploration, you might want to be carrying both. Um, I think it would be really situational dependent, but knowing that there are differences between those two devices, you can kind of make an educated decision about what you should be carrying. Yes, that's true. All right, last question, Linda. Uh, false. 
Yeah, that is false. But I was shaking my head a little bit because if you're like almost on top of any mountain in Idaho anymore, you can get um, cell signal. <laughs> but you don't, aren't always at the top of a mountain. So don't rely on your cell phones in the backcountry. <laughs> you can send your buddy. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. They, they keep telling us that we run out of time. So love you. Want to go to the next slide? So yeah, thanks. Thank you, everybody. All right, please sign up for the next presentations. We're not having one next week, next um, month because of the Christmas holiday, but come back in January. And if you have more questions, please feel free to just come up and ask us. Thanks, love.